The following audio is from Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. If you take your Bible and turn to Psalm 51 this morning, I don't know if you're aware, I'm, I'm sure that you are, that this is the year, the 500th year of what we call the Protestant Reformation. Matter of fact, this month on October 31st, we'll mark the day in 1517 that Martin Luther took his 95 Theses and nailed them to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg. That act became the beginning of what we know as the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation was... A, an effort to purge the church. And out of that reformation came the five solas, sola scriptura, that the scripture alone is what we look to for our, our practice, our faith. It is the final authority. In scripture alone, in faith alone, grace alone, through Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And so, I thought it might be fitting this day as we look 500 years behind and as we prepare for this communion meal to just talk about the Reformation, just in passing historically, and then make application for us today from the communion table and from our text in Psalm 51. In 1517, Martin Luther nailed his theses to the door. 38 years later, England would experience her first martyr. Queen Mary came to the throne. And in her five-year reign, 283 people would be burned alive at the stake. And I want you to listen this morning. 283 people burned alive at the stake for their faith. England's first martyr would be John Rogers. John Rogers was a Catholic priest who became disillusioned with Catholicism. He then left the priesthood and moved to Holland. And in God's providence, he came across a man named William Tyndale. Tyndale believed that every individual should be able to hear the word of God in their own language. And so he was in the work of translating the Bible into the English language. It was illegal to do that. Could you imagine a church opposing their people seeing and touching and reading and hearing the word of God in their own language? But that was the case. Tyndale was working on his translation And Rogers met him there. Tyndale taught him the gospel, and Rogers was converted to salvation in Christ alone. Nine months later, Tyndale was betrayed by a friend and executed. Again, the crime. Your Bible in your language. He left Rogers his manuscripts, and so Rogers compiled the text put it together. He he did not name it Tyndale's Bible because Tyndale was a martyr. He didn't name it his own name because he didn't do the work. It was called the Thomas Matthew Bible. He took it to the Archbishop of England. He was so impressed by the work that it became the first authorized version of the Bible in the English language. Rogers then moved back to England. And while he was there, Queen Mary took the throne. She was bent on bringing England back under Catholicism. Rogers knew it, and on the first Sunday on her return, he got in the pulpit and he proclaimed loudly the gospel of Jesus Christ through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. And it would be his last message. 
He was arrested and put into prison for a year. In January 1555, he was examined and condemned to die. His offense, number one, standing against the Church of Rome. Number two, he affirmed that the sacrament of the altar is not literally the body and blood of Christ. And for that doctrine, he would die. He begged to see his wife before he went to the stake, and he was denied that because, as a former priest, his marriage was illegal. And so they took him from his cell, marched him through the street. He walked past the shadow of his own church, and there he saw his wife with his youngest son, whom he had never met, standing with the ten other children that they had. And he calmly went to the stake, quoting Psalm 51. Over and over again. And then given the opportunity to recant. Now think with me. You've just walked by your wife, a child you never met, and ten of your children knowing this is the real deal, man. The pitch is there. The wood is there. The torch is there. You will be the first one to die for your faith in England, this Protestant Reformation. And they say, listen, you can recant. And Roger said, what I've preached with my lips, I will seal with my blood. And it happened over and over again. 283 who would be burned at the stakes, others drowned and beheaded. And so this morning, I just want to really point out two things as we approach this table. Number one, as we think of the Protestant Reformation, I want you to know that many of these men and women died because of their stance on communion. On communion. They refused one doctrine of the church. It was this one. The one that we come today to gather together and enjoy in liberty and freedom. They died for this one. They claim that receiving this, the bread, the cup, was not receiving the body of Christ literally. It was not being saved. It was not a means of grace. This was to be done in remembrance of him. And for that, they died. They died. They believed that salvation by God's mercy was separate from any work that we could ever do. What they said was, this is not Grace. Grace was the Son of God dying for our sins through faith alone, grace alone, in Christ alone. This sacrament is not salvation. And it was so important to them. It was worth not only living for, but dying for. Dying for. My dear brother and sister in Christ, listen to me. Doctrine and teaching are important. One doctrine. I think it was Alistair Begg. I'm not sure. I think it was him who said, an undefined Christianity is absorbable. Right? So when we go around saying, oh, I believe in God. I love God. Uh, doctrine doesn't matter. Society says, that's good. But a defined Christianity is trouble. When we dare say that salvation is found in no other name, none, there is one name under heaven given among men 
whereby we must be saved. It is Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, no woman can come to the Father through sacrament, through baptism, through religion, through good works. It's through Christ alone. When that's said, when that's defined, there's trouble. Doctrine and teaching this morning are important. What we do and why we do it matters. It matters. And what I want you to see this morning, what I want to see this morning is that men and women died for this. For a piece of bread and a cup of wine. I mean, it doesn't matter. It did matter. The symbols were saying something. And they willingly gave their lives for what we will enjoy this morning without even thinking about it. Men and women died for this. And can I tell you something? In our sterile little world that we live in this morning, today men and women are dying for this. For assembling together and believing that Jesus Christ is the God of the universe. They are being imprisoned, tortured, and killed. I think too many times, my brother, my sister, we are too casual. We are far too casual. Our faith this morning cost us nothing. Nothing. What, the price of gas to get here? To be embarrassed because you bowed your head at the workplace table? Is that right? It cost us nothing. And I believe it's been to our detriment. Luther went on to say, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. So, many of these men and women died for what we will partake of in just a few moments. We should think of that. We should think of the importance of what we're doing and what it means and what we're saying when we say, this is not literally the body and blood of Christ. He said, do this in remembrance of me. What was he saying? This is symbolic. It's spiritual. I've got to accept Jesus Christ. I've got to take him as my Savior. Men and women died for this. And the second point is simply this. Many of these men and women died quoting the 51st Psalm, which I had no idea. David Platt so eloquently made this point that this text traditionally was cited by the martyrs of the Reformation. And I have to be honest, when I first heard that, it didn't make any sense to me. Out of all scripture, why would it be that men and women 500 years ago would go to their death joyfully quoting the 51st Psalm? And when I say joyfully, listen, for Rogers... When in the flame, he acted as if they were watching him. Quoting Psalm 51. So this morning, let's look together at Psalm 51. We'll read the psalm, and I'll just make three points this morning as we gear our hearts toward the Lord's table today. Psalm 51. Let's begin at verse number one. Of course, this is the Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Almost a year later, David pens these words. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. 
Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, Thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thy altar. Psalm 51, quoted by the Reformers. Why? What's the purpose? What is this saying that somehow we miss in what was happening in our lives? And there's three things I'd like to point out this morning. Number one, the Reformers quoted this psalm on their way to their death because, number one, they knew that they needed to be washed by God. They knew they needed to be washed by God. The whole psalm reflects that language. They knew they were sinners. Listen to the words, transgressors. My transgressions, my sins, blot those things out. These men and women went to the stake knowing they needed to be washed because they were sinners. They were sinners by nature. David says, I was born in iniquity. My mother conceived me. He wasn't saying his mother was a terrible, ungodly woman. What he was saying was that by nature, my human nature is corrupt. From the beginning, from the day I'm born, my bent is away from God. We are sinners by nature. We are sinners by choice. Now listen to me. Think about these men and women. Think of their lives. They were truly pious. And I don't mean that like, oh, you pious gas bag. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, you self-righteous pious where it's a bad word. These men and women were pious. They were religious. They loved the Lord. They were going to die for him. And yet they knew they were sinners who needed to be washed. This morning we are sinners who need to be washed. We can dress up all nice, but the truth is the God of heaven, whose eyes are as a flame, sees into our hearts, our thoughts, our intents, our motives, our lust, our desires. He sees it all. They knew they were sinners. They knew their sin was serious. It was serious. Have mercy on me, O God. Why? Because sin always separates It always separates. And our sin has separated us from a holy God. You say, no big deal. I don't need God anyways. I'm cruising along in this life. That's great. But my friend, you must die. You must die. And you and I will stand before a holy, righteous God who is not a grandfather upstairs, who is not senile, who is not sure what's going on in this universe, who is the sovereign king of glory. And we will not boastfully walk into his presence and lay down, look what I've done. It means nothing. Our sin, if not dealt with, will separate us from God in a Christless hell forever. And many of us who are saved have forgotten that truth. We want to talk about heaven. But no one wants to mention hell. It's not polite to mention in polite society. Can I tell you something? If I'm on my way to destruction, I want someone shouting to me to stop. And I don't care if it doesn't come across as being polite. If you're trying to save me, shout brother, shout sister, as loud, as long, and as obnoxious. If you have to whistle while you're doing it, do it. 
And that's for those who know I hate whistling. I would listen to that. And these men and women who gave their life knew that they were sinners. Their sin was serious. That guilt separated from God. And if it was not dealt with, Jesus Christ said, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. They knew they were sinners. They knew their sin was serious. It separated from God. But can I tell you something else about sin? Our sin shapes us. It breaks us. In defying God, we have destroyed ourselves. As an individual, as a culture, as a world, when we defy God, we destroy ourselves. And it can't be any other way. Listen, when I reject the God of life, right? Life doesn't come from non-life. It doesn't work that way. It can't work that way. It's impossible. We have life because there's a God of life who breathed into man the breath of life and will take it away from you someday. He is the God of life. When I reject the God of life, all that I am left with is death. Death. We are destroying ourselves because we defy the God of heaven. When I rebel against the God of love, who proved his love, when I defy that, I am left with indifference. Not to hate. Hate is not the opposite of love. Indifference is. That I don't even care. I couldn't care less about someone and their struggles and their needs and their problems. It's all about me. That's all that's left. When I defy a God of peace and joy, the only thing that's left is emptiness. Emptiness. Death, indifference, emptiness. I have just described our world today. They knew they were sinners. They knew it was serious. And they knew that only God could save. Have mercy on me, O God. O God. Lot, wash, cleanse, purge, create. And they knew that it was accomplished only through the saving power of Jesus Christ. It was not in a cracker. It was not in a cup. It was in the creator. It was the one who became man and walked among us. He breathed our air. He trod our sod. He lived the perfect, sinless life. And the death that you and I deserved He took it. He was your sacrifice. He died for you. And they glory in that. There is no other way. No other way. And these men and women knew it. They knew they needed to be washed by God. Number two, this washing by God for them led to worship. These men and women, on their way to the stake, understood the magnitude of what had happened to them, what was done for them. They cried out for what only God could do. Lord, wash me, cleanse me. It's not in a sacrament. It's not in a church. It's not in my good works. It's not in baptism. It's not in doing the best I can. You must wash me. I am a sinner by nature, by choice. This guilt and stain doesn't come off. I can cover it, I can avoid it, I can ignore it, but in our hearts we know it's there. And what they were asking for is this, Oh God, unsin me. And that's impossible. How do you unsin them? We are full of it. We are full of sin. How can you possibly unsin someone? There's a song by Lauren Daigle. And it's how can it be? And I think she sort of captures this thought when she says this, I am guilty, ashamed of what I've done, what I've become. These hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. I've been hiding, afraid I've let you down. Inside I doubt that thou could love me 
but in your eyes there's only grace now. Though I fall, you can make me new. From this death, I will rise with you. Oh, the grace reaching out for me. Yea, how can it be? How can it be? You plead my cause. You right my wrongs. You break my chains. You overcome. You gave your life to give me mine. You say that I am free. How can it be? How is that possible? I think Paul helps us here. Look at Romans chapter 3 this morning, and Paul makes it clear how this is done. He says in verse number 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, we, we're there, we know that. But then he says this, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's where redemption is found. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a satisfaction through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He says we're justified freely by his grace through redemption in Christ The wrath of God has been satisfied through Christ and Christ alone. And now the just God can be justified because someone did pay. The God of heaven is good, righteous, and just. Therefore, he does not say about your sin and my sin, ah, don't worry about it. Okay, I'm good. So let's just forget that happened. That's not a good judge. We would never let that stand in our world today. If a guy murders and rapes a child, and he goes before a judge, and the judge says, hey, I'm a good, I'm a good judge, man. So I'm going to give you mercy. You're forgiven. We would be outraged. Would we not? And if not, there would be something wrong with us. Because we, we long for justice. But we don't long for justice when it's us. You know what we long for when it's us? Mercy. Mercy. And God says, I can't just put you to the side and say, don't worry about that sin. It's okay. Come on. You're good. He says, no, there's got to be justice. And at Calvary, justice and mercy met. And Jesus Christ died for our sin. And now, you want to talk about being unsinned? How does it happen? Because now, the righteousness of Christ, his perfect life, his holiness, um, his perfection, is transferred to all those who believe in him. So here's the, here's the great exchange. I give Jesus my sin. All of it. All of it. This is yours. And he gives me his righteousness, his holiness, and his obedience. That, my friend, is the best deal you will ever get. And so now God can be just and justify me. Why? Because Jesus Christ paid the price to all those who believe on his name. They are saved. They're born again. My brother, my sister, that should cause us to worship today. It just causes us to worship, to sit and think of these elements and the body and the blood of Christ and in our hearts almost explode that it's not my righteousness. Rick Dressler has nothing to offer God. He didn't get a deal with me, nor with you. But I get his righteousness? I can't. That's that's mind-blowing. So they knew they needed to be washed. The psalm explains that thoroughly. It led to worship is what David did after being forgiven. Therefore, we ought to witness. Look at verse number 13 of Psalm 51. He says, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted. Verse 14 echoes the same thing. Verse 15, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praises. When we are washed and understand the magnitude of what's happened to us, it should lead us to worship. And that worship within can't stay there. It it can't stay there. There's an experiment going on several years ago about putting those Mentos, those Mentos, those mint things, into a bottle of pop, and you stick them in there, and they just, I mean, they explode. It is awesome. You should do it. Maybe at the picnic we ought to do it. I don't know. But you throw a bunch of them in there, and it it explodes. I mean, it, it can't. The bottle cannot contain it. 
And, and brother and sister, I wonder what's wrong with us because we do contain it. We have the greatest news. We have the hope of fallen humanity. We have eternal life in the sun, and yet we say nothing. 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 We are to be a witness. If we've been washed and we worship him for it, something ought to be happening. And we will witness this morning with these elements. What we are saying this morning is that Jesus Christ lived perfect sinless life. He died an unjust death for me, was buried, rose again, and is coming again. That's the witness of this table this morning. But you and I must be witnesses as well with our lips and our lives. Those men and women during the Reformation time and all throughout history, honestly, and today, they were a witness with their bodies to say, I'm good. I'm good. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. We'll end with this portion of Scripture, and then we'll look to the Lord's table. Hebrews chapter 13 this morning, verse number 10. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. He's talking about the altar with the priest, right, bringing these sacrifices daily. He says, we got something better than that. They're not even worthy of coming to this table. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood was brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are buried without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the, the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The writer of Hebrew calls us to be a witness to the world on what this means today, and what this means for you, and what it means for me. Jesus suffered without the gate. Reproach, shame, humiliation, left, betrayed, forsaken. And the writer of Hebrews says, in light of that and what he's done, we then are to go outside the gate, where it's unclean, where it's dirty, where the refuse is, where all of this. We then go outside the gate, and and listen to what he says. Here's why. Because we understand, and these men and women understood, that we have no continuing city here. God's people have been too concerned about this world and not concerned at all about the world to come. It's passing, my friend. It is passing. And these men and women knew that they could give their lives for this truth because this is not my home. I'm not staying here forever. I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. That's what I'm living for. And so he says, let us then offer the sacrifice of praise. And may we this morning, in light of the truth of history that we'll celebrate this month, in light of Scripture, Psalm 51, understand that we need to be washed. My friend, if you're here this morning, listen to me. Don't leave this place without knowing Christ as your Savior. Don't don't do it. Why would you gamble on your soul? Why? Because you you can't win this one. You, You will not win this. And the truth is, the message that you heard today, like messages you've heard in the past, will condemn you. Because you're without excuse. Repent. Believe. Come to Christ. And for those of us today who know him, can we just take this all in? Can we understand what Christ has done for us? Can we glory as we touch the bread to think of his body being broken for us? As we look at the cup and the blood, understanding that his blood was shed for me. And can it fill our hearts so much that we leave this place and we can't contain it? Have I got to tell somebody? 
I'm backwards, I'm shy, I, I don't know, I get embarrassed easily, but here's a gospel track, here's the truth, come to church, let me tell you about this Savior who died for me and forgave me my sins and washed me and unsinned me. It's a glorious truth. And we celebrate it today. This time I'll ask the men to join me as we get ready to partake in the communion supper this morning.